picture is worth a thousand words. There's a saying that I've heard about a thousand times already, and if you haven't, I, I got your back. I'm going to say it a lot today. It's a saying that I love. It means a lot to me, probably to you as well, as it speaks about the importance of visual imagery. And I wanted to take you today through a short journey discussing this saying, its origins, and maybe what can it still tell us about our online world of media today. And when we talk about this, a picture is worth a thousand words, we usually attribute the saying to a certain Frederick R. Bernard. And about a hundred years ago, Mr. Bernard, an advertiser, he was working for the uh, national, he was a national advertising manager for the Street Railways Advertising Company. And what he did, basically, his role was when you climbed up to one of those streetcars, you saw these amazing, beautiful, full-colored ads, it was responsible to raising awareness to these advertisements, get you to buy more. And when we talk about a picture is worth a thousand words, we usually refer to one particular op-ad that Mr. Bernard wrote for the Printers, Inc. magazine. You'll hear that name a few times today, the Printers, Inc. magazine. In 1927, this was the ad. He was speaking about a very successful ad campaign of one baking powder. And if you look at the top left of this page, you'll see a Chinese proverb saying one picture is worth 10,000 words. So 100 years passed by, some deflation, right? We're now only 1,000 words. A few things here, Chinese proverbs usually associate with one Confucius with one problem there. Um, Confucius never actually said that, and we can't actually find the Chinese or origins of this saying. More than that, some cracks right in these, this theory. Six years prior to that, same Frederick R. Bernard, same Printers, Inc. magazine. One look is worth a thousand words. By the way, thanks Google. This is all these scans that you'll see today from Google's uh, library scanning project. This specific scan is uh, slightly more difficult to read. Let me help with that. One look is worth a thousand words. So said a famous Japanese philosopher. And he was right. People like to read picture. Everybody likes to read picture. So Japanese, Chinese, something is happening over here. And um, at 1948, um, a very household common book called The Home Book of Proverbs, Maxim, and Familiar Phrases was published, and the author actually reached out to uh, Mr. Bernard and asked him about this. So what's going on, Japanese, Chinese? And Mr. Bernard said that, uh, yeah, actually I came up with this saying. I just said, associate that with an Asian philosopher so people will, will, will take me more seriously. <laughs> By the way, it's a great read. The Home Book of Proverbs, Maxim and Familiar Phrases is still available on Amazon today, the original 1948 print. It's an easy 3,000 page read. Now, the more disappointing thing here is that, yes, when Mr. Bernard came up with it himself, this is oh good. I was looking for something really inspirational, right, to take away from that. That wasn't very inspirational. The problem was that it wasn't even him that came up with his original sentence. Um, One look is worth a thousand words. Here is an ad published a couple of years before that. One look is worth a thousand words. Maybe this is the original article. Now, at this point, I was quite confused. I was a little bit disappointed. I had a whole story going on about truth in advertisement and fake news, and oh no, I was looking for something inspirational to take away from this. But then luckily, I continued with my uh, idiomatic rabbit hole of research, then let go, and found another interesting lead. And that lead got me to 1911, and a really interesting article that, that was published on the Post Standard. And it covered a very unique event, a banquet, 450 people, sponsored by the Syracuse Advertisement Men's Club, but it wasn't about advertisements. It was about journalism. Some of the most powerful men, women of this time frame, we're talking congressmen, we're talking senators, some of the most famous men about, uh, around advertisement, powerful, influentials, influential people around journalism, that were in this event, and the main speaker, a certain Arthur Brisbane. Arthur Brisbane, 
a very famous journalist and one of the most famous newspaper editors in America of all time. Very influential, very inspirational speaker. What happened there, and Arthur Brisbane, very inspirational talk, was covered in an article one month later on the Printers Inc. magazine, the same magazine that Mr. Bernard was frequently reading that was 10 years before Mr. Bernard's article, and to, to get a, take a few excerpts from that, title is, Newspaper Copy That People Must Read. What Arthur Brisbane said, closing this very considerable event, was that newspapers are in their infancy, think websites, they have only just begun, the most difficult and the most useful thing, whether in an editorial or an advertisement, think shopping website or news website, is that it be such as the man who reads it must understand, not can understand, but must, tell the story quickly. Tell the story, tell it quickly. And how do you do that? Use a picture. It's worth a thousand words. And then he continued with a famous quote, his favorite quote, quoting Shakespeare, piece of Macbeth, and ended with the words that, as I read them, is, if you're Shakespeare, you can use the words, otherwise, use a picture. It's worth a thousand words. Now, that was inspiring. That was really nice. And uh, soon afterwards, I've uh, <clears throat> updated the Wikipedia page that covers this topic, so we give the right attribution to the right person. And while I was still contemplating whether or not I just rewrote history or put history the right people where, where it belonged. I was still wondering of what is my takeaway from this short journey. Now, I was born in the beautiful city of Haifa in northern Israel. And uh, late 80s, early 90s, I was uh, in high school, summer vacation, beautiful Saturday morning. I was meeting with a group of my good friends for uh, in one, one of my friend's dad's clinic in town and for our biweekly game of D&D, &D, Dungeons and Dragons, the geek that I am. I wear it proudly. And our DM, our dungeon master, Ronan, great guy, few years older than us, just started college at the Haifa Technion, the so-called uh, Israeli MIT, wishful thinking. It is a great college. And uh, he told us about this incredible video game that he just ran into, an incredible video game. And as he said it, it's you play with other people, multiplayer role-playing games, that was rare at the time. You create small parties and you go hunt monsters and it's uh, uh, amazing quests and mysteries that you solve and if you rise in ranks you can become a god and as a god you can actually extend the game and add quests and add monsters. And it sounded incredible and you have to try it out. And the next day, he snuck us into the Technion, to the Technion server room. Actually, not a server room, more of a terminal room, all connected to a centralized huge mainframe, the Technion 2, massive T2. And we logged on to this game, we talented over to the game servers, and we started playing the game that was as, in any way as incredible as what Ronen just told us. It was incredible. It was mind-blowing. The thing is, I remember logging in and the next thing I remember was logging out a month later, clearly remember walking out of there, 10 p.m. My summer vacation was done, I had one more day of, and I was thinking, oh no, what happened to my last, last, ma last lost month? And that was the last day I was playing video game, multiplayer video games for the rest of my life. That's a major takeaway for me. And this incredible video game that for me, by the way, the best video game I ever played up until then and since then, and I've played a lot of video game geeks, I already established that, looks something like this in all its incredible graphical glory. 4K, Ultra HD, right, incredible, 3D ray tracing, not a single picture. Not a single image. It was basically a multiplayer text adventure. It's called an LP MUD, MUD multi-user dungeon. By the way, it's still available today if you want to try it out. 
not a single photo. And it makes sense, because to put that in perspective, we're talking about early 90s. That was before the World Wide Web. The first page on the World Wide Web, August 1991, that's CERN, text only. Clearly remember the first browser that I ever used, that's Lynx, L-Y-N-X. Text only browser on a text only terminal. By the way, the Lynx, Lynx project is still supported by the community. You can download it right now. I'm not sure that you should, but you can. This is the Lynx browser browsing to the Lynx page on Wikipedia. This was Amazon soon after they launched. This is Amazon's first web page, not a single photo except for the logo over there. As Jeff Bezos and his then wife McKinsey envisioned. And this is the website they used to sell their first online book. By the way, interesting tidbit about Amazon. I have a friend that says that uh, you can tell a lot about a founder by asking him how did he come up with the name of his company. I'm not sure if you know the original name that Jeff and McKinsey had in mind for Amazon. This relentless couple and relentless company was relentless.com. By the way, if you go to relentless.com, you'll be auto-forwarded to Amazon. After he talked to a few of his friends, they told him, hey, it sounds a little bit sinister. Maybe you should think about it. And then was when he changed it uh, to the new name, Kadabra. Yes. And a few months later, one of his lawyers um, misspell it to cadaver, and this is when we came up with the actual name. 25 years later, this text-only website, wall-to-wall -wall imagery, beautiful, just you know, captures your attention. Better? That's a question for us. Let's look at another example. 1994, that's Yahoo. Yahoo back then, a well-curated list of links. This is the only way that I knew back then on how to browse the web, how we can find anything. It's really funny to see that there are 301 news pages online. That was it, 1994. Fast forward 25 years, news pages, wall-to-wall -wall imagery, videos, beautiful ads. eBay, 1997, when it was still called Auction Web, text-only websites. This is the website that uh, Pierre Omidyar launched, and this is the website he used to sell his first product. It worked. And the first product ever sold on eBay was a broken laser pen. A broken laser pen. And as the story goes, Mr. Romidiar bought that, that pen to use it to, for his presentations. Only he ended up using it to play with his cat, because you know, laser pens. And it broke two weeks later, because you know, laser pens. And what he did was put it online on his new auction website for $1. And there was a bidding war around this, and it ended up getting bought for $15. And he felt so bad that he actually contacted the, the, the buyer and told him, hey, do you know that this is a broken pen? And he told him, yes, I know, this is exactly what I wanted, which actually started a very negative turn of events, right, that was later on being used to say that, hey, this was bought by a broken laser pen collector, and people on the internet will buy anything. 20 years later, by the way, the, the eBay had an interview with the same person, which was uh, very offended by all of this because, he, as he said, look, laser pens were really expensive at that time. I could have paid $100 for one, and I love to tinker with electronics, so I rather, you know, I bought something broken to fix it, and then, right, that's a great story. And it actually is much more inspiring like that with only one problem. The pen that he's holding, the original one, it's still broken. <laughs> How do you call a person that holds a broken laser pen for 20 years? Broken laser pen collector? I don't know. 25 years later, eBay, beautiful, wall-to-wall -wall imagery. Very different than the text-only version of the website that we've seen 25 years ago. And last example, Google. Google 1998, maybe not the first search engine, but at least by me, definitely the best back then. 
And again, 20 years later, completely different. Beautiful wall-to-wall -wall imagery, videos. <laughs> Maybe not everything changes, but the thing is, 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 is this, right? We had text-only website. What happened to them? I have a theory that your favorite music that you've been listening to on your teens is, is printed on your neurons, and this is the music that you'll keep on listening for the rest of your lives. Um, think about it. For me, that's grunge music, Seattle grunge. Any Seattle grunge fans in the audience? Any? Yes, a few. I see a few. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Save Eddie Vedder, hashtag, yes. Um, that was, for me, sounds of the 90s, but, but when I think sounds of the 90s, I also, I also think... Yeah, who here had the pleasure, had the pleasure to download a photo on a 2400 baud modem? Yes, I see you, great. Who here immediately noticed that this is, in fact, not the sound of a 2400, but of a 28.8K baud modem? <laughs> I see, by the way, this is a very useful skill and it will make a comeback. It will make a comeback and everybody will be jealous at us. It was excruciating to download a photo on a modem. It was also an incredible experience, at least for me. I remember the first, I clearly remember the first photos that I downloaded as someone that was used to moving text around between computers. Suddenly you see scan lines of an actual photo moved halfway across the world over to your computer. It was incredible. It also took long minutes. So it makes sense that we don't, you know, back then at least, saw huge, beautiful photographs on websites. But let me ask that differently. What about today, right? Where are all the text-only websites today? It's the internet. We can find anything on the internet, right? People won't buy anything. Where are all the text websites? Modern ones. Now, this, this nice individual curates the best text-only websites on the web, which is great, good for him. Um, this is it. This is his list. It's actually one page long. And some of the websites I love, Hacker News, text-only, it's great. <laughs> RFC Index is a really great website. CNN is also on the list, and it's, we know that CNN is very media-rich, what's going on over there. Not exactly text only. CNN has a light version of its website. So uh, when we have emergencies, global emergencies, spotty connection, people can still read through the top news, which is incredibly commendable. This is also what's happening with NPR. Other website, beautiful website like WTTR.in at the bottom, a weather website. It's great. It's looking, it's, it's really cool. This is but ASCII art, right? So I don't know, text only, not text only. And there is one thing that is missing, at least for me, from that list, right? We see news websites. Where are all the text-only shopping websites? It sounds funny, but again, internet, right? We can find anything. We can find anything except for text-only shopping websites. By the way, one result, it's a wrong result, but here is a challenge for you. These are four, I was very, ha, huh, this is interesting. Four words, common words in the English dictionary. All together, so there is only one website on the internet, according to Google, that has all of these words. Here is a challenge for you guys. And it makes sense, right? When I <laughs> read my morning news, my morning cat news, I want to see number 11, Snoopy, the cutest cat ever. Reading about that is one thing. But seeing that, it's a whole, is a whole different thing. So we want, I guess, beautiful, large, great photography. Only problem there is, as a species, we have a very, very short attention span. And according to Google, on your mobile devices, if it takes more than three seconds for your website to load, half of your visitor will walk away. Half of your visitors, just three seconds. Not three minutes, three seconds. Why does it take your website three seconds to load? Usual culprit, 50% of your page weight is usually images. The easiest way to solve 
download times, view times, delete all your images. But we've already seen that it doesn't work. In fact, there is a very clear balance here. Orange line shows total internet traffic greatly correlated to the speed of the, our networks. In yellow is the number of bytes that we push to our customers image-wise, number of images. Is the, way, the way I read that, there is a great correlation between faster internet and getting our customers more, our viewers more and more imagery data. There is an interesting question, at least for me there, about causation versus correlation. Shopping, e-commerce, market online is a $3 trillion business, growing 15% year over year. If we can improve conversion there with beautiful imagery, but just 1%, that's tens of billions of dollars of value. But total web traffic, today is just 20% of our internet use. Over 60% is streaming videos. In fact, Netflix alone is on par internet usage with everything we do on the web, otherwise web browsing. By the way, Netflix can peak at 40% as our global internet traffic. So streaming video, does that push the envelope? Is just a $50 billion industry? Good question, not sure. Back to images, can we go back one slide? Back to images, one question is, so is it, is it the more the merrier? We need a lot of photos, let's add more and more photography. It's not about that, so this is, this is a question that is very clear. When we look at internet trends today, the number of images on website actually decreases over time. Let me summarize that for a sec. Woo, jumping ahead. Let's go back, three slides. One more. Sorry about that. Let me summarize that for a sec. So what, 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 what the story so far, right? Text alone is not enough. You have to use strong, powerful imagery. You don't need a lot of that, but it needs to be relevant and big and exciting and beautiful. And it's critical for your user experience. It can be the make or break of every website out there. Shopping, news, social websites, advertisements. We started Clownery seven years ago. And back then we had a small consultancy shop and we ran into complex challenges around media almost on a daily basis. We decided to solve that for ourselves. We, we had a small hope that, that other developers maybe you know, use that, maybe that will be beneficial for them as well. But we were looking at this problem for, from a very narrow set of plans, from a very small keyhole. We were looking at developers, wanted to help developers solve their media challenges. In fact, when we started, we haven't even realized how complex that is, how big the world is, right? This is, this is something that, that I clearly remember saying, hey, we'll just solve images and move onwards to other areas. We wanted to talk about video, we wanted to talk about helping non-developers manage their media. Right? Seven years later, 200 people on the team were still working on images on a daily basis. That's a lot of work, big challenge but a lot of value. By the way, this is what happens when you ask three introvert co-founders to pose for a picture. <laughs> three introvert co-founders, right? Okay. So many things going wrong with that picture. Mm -hmm. Seven years later, we're still learning new things. It took us four years to be three, a little over three years, to be comfortable enough to say, okay, we're ready to start talking about video. And now we have an incredible video solution that is on par with our image solution. We're, we're, we're very proud to tell you a little bit more about that later today. By the way, one interesting thing here, this is a blog post, our launch. We, we share that with a, the with a team. This is the opening words. They say that a picture is worth a thousand words. Here it is again. 
The question here, if a picture is worth a thousand words, how much is a video worth, right? The question for uh, another time, maybe. It took us three more years to have the attention, mind span, okay, now we can finally talk about non-developers as well. And we launched our digital asset management solution. We're very proud to tell you about that today and share some exciting news around that. As I said, we're 200 people on the team, three offices in Israel, in London, and here in Santa Clara. The team wanted to say hi. Hi, everybody. And um, one interesting tidbit about Cloudinary, we, we took a slightly different uh, journey in Silicon Valley. Um, maybe a slightly different outlook on the Bay Area. By the way, this is the Bay Area from the top of the majestic Mount Amunem. Santa Cruz mountain range. Um, we had amazing customers early on. These customers shared and spread the word around. And we managed to grow organically. We we're profitable day one. We're still profitable today. We never raised external funds, which allowed us to focus on only one thing, thing that matters most to us, and that's our customers. Almost half a million developers that sign up to the servers so far, incredible brands that we're excited, humbled to serve, and brands that we learn a lot from on a day-to-day -day basis. Things that we take and put back into the products. And in fact, our goal today is to continue sharing those insights with you in the next couple of days. And I know that I learned a lot in that journey. One thing I learned, for example, is not to play multiplayer games ever again. Single play games for the win. Yeah, what a great game. Red Dead Redemption fans, by the way? Yes? No? Someone? Yeah, some, some in the audience. Incredible. Full circle. So is a picture worth a thousand words, right? This is what I started with. And I think that the mathematician in me thinks that um, maybe, maybe that's not an accurate representation. Thousand words, so two thousand words are better than a picture. And from everything I've learned, I think that the... Uh, more accurate term is that for the online consumer, no amount of words can replace a few great photos. And we're here today to help you make your photos great. And to do that, and to tell you a little bit more about our product, what we have been doing, what we're working on right now, and what we're working on towards the future, I'd love to invite my good friend, Clarence's co-founder and chief product officer on Adobe Sufferman to the stage. Great slides that you kept as a secret from us in the last few weeks. The first time we saw that. Of course. <laughs> and, you, and you have a typo there. You forgot to remove the asterisk. <laughs> I'm going to steal a minute. <laughs> But that's okay. Can I? Okay. Sure. Minutes only. No, there is an asterisk there. Thank you. Sorry about that. Um, there is an asterisk there because, sorry, mathematician, I don't know, uh, developer. Um, th there, is, there is one part of the population that, that this actually doesn't work well for. So really quickly, last year we had an amazing, amazing presentation by Kate, Katie Seiler Miller. Still available online. Go to the Clarum website. Check it out here in ImageCon last year. And... Um, she talked about uh, uh, people with, uh, with visual impairments. And if there is one part of the population that, for them, images are not working too well right now on the web are people with, with visual impairments. About 5% of the population uses screen readers to interact with your website. Screen readers do not understand images. We need to help them out. There are ways to do that. Uh, and, and, and we talk a little bit about accessibility today. But what we don't talk about is available on our website, in blog posts, in this beautiful talk, and, and contact us if you want to learn more about that. So, so that's just a uh, side note. Other than that, yes. No matter for us, give me a few great photos. Thank you for that. Sorry about that. Thank you. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs>